Hello, welcome to lecture four. Today, as usual, I'll start out with a little bit of review. We're going to talk about Kirchhoff's voltage law and Kirchhoff's current law again, just the high points of that. I'm going to do some more analysis examples of electrical circuits using these laws. Um, I'll also talk about non-ideal sources. We talked about ideal sources a couple of lectures ago. We mentioned that they had some problems with infinite power delivery. We're going to upgrade those models to try to eliminate that shortcoming. And at the very end of the lecture, I'm going to mention in passing series and parallel circuit elements, basically just to set us up for lecture five when we'll get into this heavily. If you want to do some reading, the related educational modules are 1.4 and 1.5. Okay, Kirchhoff's voltage law and Kirchhoff's current law. Just in summary, Kirchhoff's voltage law says that the algebraic sum of all the voltage differences around a closed loop has to be zero. So if I have some number of voltage differences, one through n around a closed circuit, okay, where I start at one node and I end up at the same node, I will add those all up and end up with zero. Remember, some of them have to be positive voltages, some of them will be negative voltages so that they can cancel out. Kirchhoff's current law says that the sum of all the currents entering or leaving any particular node has to be zero. You cannot accumulate charge at a node. So if I take a number of currents, one through n at a particular node, add all those up, I end up with zero. It's vitally important for both of these that you're consistent with your signs. You have to pay attention to your passive sign convention. A quick recap of general circuit analysis approaches. The first thing we're going to do in any particular analysis is assign all of the voltages and currents for every passive element in the system. Okay, we have to use the passive sign convention. We have to be consistent with that. If you don't do this first, you won't know how to apply Kirchhoff's voltage law and Kirchhoff's current law. Okay, then we can apply Kirchhoff's voltage law, Kirchhoff's current law, and the voltage current relationships for the individual elements to write a number of equations in a number of unknowns. Typically, our unknowns will be the voltages and currents at every element. So we must write one equation to match each of those unknowns. If we have n unknowns, we'll need n equations. This is how we get those equations. For now, our voltage current relationship, the only one we have available to us is for resistors, Ohm's law, V is equal to I times R. Later on, when we get to capacitors and inductors, we'll have some additional voltage current relationships that we can use. Okay, so what we want to do is write as many equations as we have unknowns, then we can solve for the desired unknowns. Now, if we don't need to know the voltages and currents in all of the elements, we may not need to write as many equations. Okay, basically, once you know what you need to find out, you can write the equations to find out those specific things. I want to do a quick example illustrating Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law and their application to circuit analysis. For this circuit, I want to determine number one, VAC, and remember the subscript notation for defining voltages. I mean that I want the voltage difference between nodes A and C, and remember that the first subscript corresponds to the node that is assumed to be at the higher voltage. I also want to determine V sub X, that's de defined on the diagram as being the voltage across this resistance R sub X. V D E, which is the voltage difference between D and E with D being assumed as the higher voltage node. R sub X, the resistance here, and the power absorbed by this 2 ohm resistor. Okay, take a quick shot at this example. Come back, watch what I do with it if you want to. Okay, first I'm going to find VAC. VAC is the voltage difference between nodes A and C, with A being assumed to be the positive node. Take a look at your circuit for a while and try to find the easiest way to do the problem. If I do Kirchhoff's voltage law, around this entire loop, say for example I start here, I have a 10 volt source, I know what that voltage is, 
The voltage between here and here is VAC. That's what I'm supposed to try to find. And then I have a 3 volt difference between nodes C and E. So I know everything about KVL here with the exception of one unknown. I only need to write one equation to find VAC. Notice that in order to find VAC, we don't need to find V sub X or this voltage. I don't need all the individual voltages. I just need the voltage between here and here. So let's do KVL. If I start down here, I go into the negative terminal first. That's a minus 10 volts. I go into the positive terminal of VAC, so I have a plus VAC. And then coming through here, I go into the positive terminal of the 3 volt source. That all sums to 0, so VAC must be 10 minus 3 volts is 7 volts. Okay, continuing on with the example. We found earlier that VAC was 7 volts with the higher voltage potential being at node A. We came up with a positive number. The next thing we want to find is V sub X. We know that the current through R sub X is 1 amp. If we knew what R sub X was, we could use Ohm's law to determine V sub X directly. We don't know R sub X, so we have to figure out something else. We're kind of lucky in that I know that I have a 2 amp source going through here. If I do KCL at this node, I know that I have 2 amps going through this 3 ohm resistor. The current going into this node has to be the same as the current coming out of this node. So I know 2 out of the 3 currents that can be converging at node B. If I do KCL at B, The currents going into the node have to equal the currents coming out of the node. So if I define an I2 ohm in this direction, and then this is going to be my voltage across this 2 ohm resistor, notice that they agree with the passive sign convention, I2 ohm has to be equal to 1 amp plus 2 amps. Now, if I know that this particular current is 3 amps, and I have the resistance, I know what this voltage is. So V2 ohm is equal to 3 amps times 2 ohms. Using Ohm's law, this is 6 volts. Okay. So this voltage difference across the 2 ohm resistor is 6 volts. Now, if I redo my same voltage loop that I did before, okay, from this KVL, I now know this voltage difference because it's given. I know this voltage difference because I determined it up here. And I know this voltage difference. The only thing that I don't know is V sub X. So I get a minus 10 volts coming into this guy plus V sub X coming into this guy plus 6 volts going through here plus 3 volts going through there. I think I get V sub X equal to 1 volt. Okay, the next thing I need to determine is VDE, the voltage difference between nodes D and E, with D being the node that is assumed to be at the highest voltage. Notice that the circuit is not physically closed between D and E, but I can still do KVL around this loop. I'm doing this loop because I don't know what VDE is, but I know all of the other voltage differences in that loop. I can write one equation, solve it for the one unknown that I have. KVL, I'm going to start down here because by habit I usually start at the lower left-hand corner. Minus 3 volts, I hit the negative terminal of this first, plus 1 volt, I hit the positive terminal of this first, plus VDE. I hit the positive terminal of VDE first. That sums to 0. Therefore, VDE is 
3 minus 1 is 2 volts. I think the next thing that I want to find is R sub x. Previously, I determined that V sub x was 1 volt. If I know the voltage difference in the current through the resistor, that defines the resistance value. So by Ohm's law, R sub x is equal to V sub x over the current, 1 amp, which is just 1 volt over 1 amp. So R sub x is 1 ohm. The very last thing that I wanted to find was the power dissipated by this 2 ohm resistor. I previously found out that this current was 3 amps and this voltage was 6 volts. P 2 ohm is that current, 3 amps, times the voltage, 6 volts, so the 2 ohm resistor is dissipating 18 watts of power. Resistors can only dissipate power. I also want to use this example to introduce a couple of new terms, open circuits and short circuits. Nodes D and E are not connected. These guys constitute what is called an open circuit. There's actually a break in the circuit between here and here. No current can flow through an open circuit. The resistance is infinite. Okay. Likewise, we talked about perfect conductors earlier. Remember we said that a node could be spread out by perfect conductors there is no voltage difference. So no matter how much current I flow through this leg here, there's no voltage difference between this node and this node. This is sometimes called a short circuit. Okay. I'll be using that terminology again a little bit later on and probably through the rest of the course. So a short circuit has no voltage difference across it. An open circuit has no current through it. OK, a few tips relative to circuit analysis. As I said before, there are generally more than one way to do a problem. If you spend some time looking at the problem first, you may save some time in the long run rather than just jumping in and starting to write e random equations that may not lead you to exactly where you want to go. You'll notice that in the previous circuit example, for most of the stuff that I did, I had one equation and one unknown. I think in one particular section, I had to do KCL and then apply Ohm's law. Other than that, I wasn't writing uh, eight equations and eight unknowns and solving for everything. I had one thing that I wanted to find and I went and found it. Keep in mind the subscript notation. We'll be using subscripts later on to denote voltages and voltage polarities. That showed up on the last example as well. Likewise, when I found VAC, I did not find all the individual voltages in the loop in that previous example. I could skate over the fact that I didn't know two things about that loop and combine them into one unknown. Also, you don't need to have a physically closed circuit in order to apply KVL. You can apply KVL across an open circuit. A couple of other helpful hints. In general, doing Kirchhoff's voltage law through a current source is not going to be immediately helpful. It may be helpful if you want to find the voltage difference across the current source, but since a current source has an arbitrary voltage across it, if you do KVL across a current source, you've generally just introduced an additional unknown to go with your additional equation, so you generally haven't gained any ground. The same comment goes to KCL next to a voltage source. A voltage source can give you any current that you want it to give you. If you're doing KCL, yes, you're writing another equation, but generally you're getting another unknown, which is the current through the voltage source. 
Now, if you want to know what the current through the voltage source is, that's a good thing to do. If you don't need to know that for the problem at hand, generally it's a waste of time. Okay, another circuit analysis example. I want to find the voltages across both this 10 ohm resistor and this 20 ohm resistor. Take a shot at that and then come back. The first thing I'm going to do is define my unknown voltages and currents so that I know what positive directions correspond to. Let's call this voltage difference V1 and claim that this current is I1. Let's claim that the current through this is positive in this direction, it's I2, and that means that the voltage polarity has to be positive at the upper node of this resistor. Now I can start writing equations and determining what V1 and V2 are. Um, it looks like KVL is going to be something to do. Let's write that equation. I'm generally not going to want to do KVL through this guy because, yes, I can find the voltage across here, but that voltage is unknown anyway, so I'm adding another equation and I have another unknown. KVL, starting down here, tells me that minus 10 volts V1, I hit the positive terminal first, so I add that. V2, I hit the positive terminal first, so I add that. That sums to zero. I've got one equation and two unknowns. I need to do some more equations. Um, let me try KCL here. I know what this current coming in here is, so that gives me a piece of information in KCL. KCL tells me that the sum of the currents going into the node is the same as the sum of the currents leaving the node. I1 is assumed to be going into the node. One amp is definitely going into the node, and I2 is coming out. So I1 plus one amp is equal to I2. I've added another equation. I've added two more unknowns. Now I have two equations and four unknowns. I'm losing ground rapidly. However, I can write V1 in terms of I1 because I know the resistances. So if I apply Ohm's law, V1 is equal to this resistance, 10 ohms, times I1. And V2 is this resistance, 20 ohms, times I2. So I can use this. These two in conjunction with this to say that V1, which is 10I1, plus V2, which is 20I2, is equal to 10. Then I can claim that I2 is I1 plus 1 amp. So I have 10I1 plus 20 times I1 plus 1 amp equals 10. I can pick up from this equation, solve this equation for I1. So I have 30 I1 plus 20 is equal to 10. I1 is equal to 10 minus 20, which is minus, so minus one third of an amp. I2 is I1 plus 1. That's equal to plus two-thirds of an amp. So I1 is actually going right to left. I2 is in its correct direction. I want to find the voltages. V1 is this resistance times I1. It is minus 10 over 3 volts. And from this and Ohm's law, V2 is 20 times I2. This becomes 40 thirds volts. 20 times 2 is 40 divided by 3 is that. That's what I want to find. Okay, let's do a quick example. We want to determine the voltages across these two resistors. Give that a try, then come back and I'll do the problem for you. Okay, first thing we need to do is define what we mean by positive voltages and positive currents. Those have to be consistent with the passive sign convention. 
Suppose I want V1 to be positive in this direction, then I have to pick the current I1 to be positive that way. If I choose I2 to be positive this way, then V2 is positive in this direction. Now that I know what I mean by positive, I can apply KVL and KCL consistently and get to an answer that I can actually interpret. I have a voltage source here, so I'm going to try to use KVL going through that in some way. I probably don't want to loop through this current source because then I add another unknown voltage. So let me do KVL around this loop. KVL, if I start at the lower left-hand corner, I will hit the negative terminal of the 10-volt source first, which means I have a negative contribution. The positive terminal of V1 is encountered first. The positive terminal of V2 is encountered first. So V1 plus V2 is equal to 10 volts. Now I can probably, any other KVL I do will go through this current source, so I'm probably going to try to avoid KVL unless I actually need to later on. I'm going to give a KCL a shot. And in fact, if I do KCL here, I know one of the currents going into that node. That's definitely a bonus. KCL tells me that the sum of the currents entering a node has to be balanced by the currents leaving the node. I, this one amp current is definitely going into the node, and I am assuming I1 is going into the node. So I1 plus one amp is equal to the current coming out of the node, which is I2. So now I've got two equations and four unknowns, I1, I2, V1, and V2. I need at least two more equations, assuming that I don't introduce any more unknowns. I can easily get two equations from the voltage-current relationships for the two passive elements. So Ohm's law tells me that V1 is equal to 10 ohms, that resistance, times the current through that resistor, I1. V2 is equal to the resistance, which is 20 ohms, times its current, which is I2. Now I've got one, two, three, four equations and four unknowns. I can solve those for all four of my unknowns, and that will give me my voltages. I'll go to the next slide and do that. At the end of the previous slide, we had defined our positive voltages and currents, and we had written four equations and four unknowns. Now I'm going to go ahead and solve those equations and determine the voltages that we originally wanted to know. If I substitute these two equations into this equation, 10I1 becomes V1, 20I2 becomes V2. That is just equal to 10 volts. Now, if I note that I2 is equal to I1 plus 1 amp, I am down to one equation and one unknown. This becomes 30I1 plus 20 is equal to 10. Taking the 20 over to this side gives me a negative 10. So I1 is minus 10 over 30, or I1 is minus a third of an amp. If I know what I1 is, I can easily find I2. So let me go up here. I2 is equal to I1 plus 1 amp. So I2 is equal to plus 2 thirds of an amp. Now I know the currents through both of these re resistors. I know the resistance values. I can easily determine the voltages from Ohm's law. So V1 is 10 times I1, so that is minus 10 thirds of a volt. And V2 is 20 times I2. 20 times 2 is 40. That is positive 40 thirds of a volt. Notice that I1 and V1 are negative. That simply means that we chose the wrong current direction and the wrong voltage polarity. So this voltage is actually higher than here, and the current is going right to left. Another example, very practical. We have a dead car battery. Should be running at 12 volts. It's actually only putting out a 2 volt potential difference. We would like to charge this battery up. Typically, we know we can do that by connecting that up with a charged battery. So we're going to 
take this 12 volt battery, connect it to our dead battery that's only got two volts. So we'll run some current into the dead battery and recharge it. So let's find out what that current actually is. Let's start out by doing KVL here. If I do KVL around this loop, let me start down here, I get minus 12 volts plus 2 volts is equal to zero. I have a huge problem. KVL is not satisfied for this circuit. What do we do about that? Is KVL wrong? Not really. What we've done is modeled the batteries as ideal voltage sources. That may not be appropriate here. Okay, these guys may not be ideal, so what do we do if our ideal voltage source model doesn't work? We have to modify it to match reality because I know I can take two batteries and hook them up this way and recharge the low voltage battery. So the next thing I want to talk about is models of non-ideal voltage and current sources. Okay, I'm going to talk about non-ideal voltage source models first, then we'll go to non-ideal current sources. In general, we're going to create our non-ideal voltage source by adding a source resistance in series with our ideal voltage source. So we're going to take an ideal voltage source here, add a resistance to this. This entire combination is going to consist of our non-ideal voltage source. This term series we'll talk more about a little bit later. What we really mean by that informally is that any current that this guy pumps out has to go in here. Current isn't going to head off in any other direction. There's nowhere else for it to go. Non-ideal current source models. What we're going to do is take a source resistance, put that in what is called parallel with an ideal current source. So we've got an ideal current source. There's a resistance inside our non-ideal current source that is in parallel with this resistance. Again, I'll define parallel a little bit more officially later. In short, what it means is that any voltage difference seen by this guy is also seen by this guy. Now let's take these guys and add them into our previous problem so that now our charging battery consists of a nice strong 12 volt battery with an internal source resistance. Our dead battery consists of a 2 volt source also in series with its internal resistance. Now we can take a look at analyzing this. I can define voltages and currents for RS1 and RS2. Call this one I1 with a voltage difference V1 and this one I2 with a voltage difference V2. If I do KCL at this node, that tells me that the current going in I1 is the same as the current going out, which is I2. I don't need subscripts for shorthand. I'm just going to call that I. Now I can legitimately loop around here and make KVL work. So starting down here, I have a minus 12 volts plus V1. I'm going to go ahead and incorporate Ohm's law as I go. V1 is I times RS1. Now I add V2, which by Ohm's law is just I times RS2. Then I hit this 2 volt source. I'm seeing the positive terminal first. All that sums to 0. Doing some rearranging, I times RS1 plus RS2 is equal to the negative of 2 minus 12, which is 10 volts or I is equal to 10 volts over RS1 plus RS2. So the internal resistances allow us to determine what I is and actually limits the current going through this. Okay, a couple of lectures ago, I mentioned that ideal sources can provide infinite power. Since a voltage source can give you any current you ask for, and since a current source can give you any voltage you ask for, the power output from those can be infinite. 
I didn't do a very official job of doing that. Now that we have some analysis techniques, I want to show why that is and under what circumstances that happens. So for example, let's take an ideal voltage source and connect a load to it. So we have this ideal source. We're going to connect a load resistance to it. We need to define our positive voltage polarities and current directions. I'm going to claim that positive voltage is here and current is going into the positive voltage node. If I look at this and now do KVL around this loop, that tells us that minus V sub S plus V load is equal to 0, or V load is equal to V sub S. We know that for a resistor, power is equal to V squared over R. So the power dissipated by this load is equal to V load squared, which is just V sub S, over R load. If this load resistance gets small, this gets big. So in the limit, P load goes to infinity as R load goes to 0. And in fact, what's happening here, as R load goes to 0, this guy looks like a short circuit. If I put a voltage across a short circuit, I get infinite current, which results in infinite power. And actually, there's a fundamental inconsistency here. This voltage source is claiming, I'm going to give you V sub S regardless of how much current that requires. And this short circuit is saying, I'm not going to have any load voltage difference. This voltage is going to be 0 no matter how much current you give me. I end up getting infinite power delivery. Okay, my non-ideal sources will actually limit the power delivered to a load because of the internal source resistance. So I'm going to take a look at applying a load to a non-ideal voltage source first, then we'll do the non-ideal current source next. So I have my non-ideal voltage source here consisting of an ideal voltage source and an internal source resistance. I'm going to connect the terminals of this non-ideal source to a load resistance. I'm going to choose a load voltage polarity as shown, which means that the current going to the load has to go into the positive voltage node. Now, if I do KCL at this node, the current going into that node has to be the same as the current coming out of that node. That means that the current through R sub S is also I load. So now the voltage drop across R sub S is, by Ohm's law, R sub S times I load. The voltage drop across the load is I load times R load. So if I do KVL around the entire loop, Starting down here, I hit a negative terminal first, so I have a minus V sub S plus the voltage drop across this resistor I already said was R sub S times I load. And the voltage drop across this resistor is R load times I load. All that has to be equal to 0. So I can group the I load terms and take V sub S over to the other side. So V sub S is equal to R sub S plus R load all times I load. Now also by Ohm's law, I can say that V load is equal to I load times R load. So I load here is V load over R load. Substituting that in here and solving for V load gives me V load is equal to R load over R sub S plus R load times V sub S. Now we can take a look at the power delivered to the load. Power delivered is V squared over R. So the power delivered to the load, P load, is equal to V load squared over R load. 
if I square this entire term here, I end up with an R load squared over RS plus R load squared. The R load squared will cancel with this one, so I end up with an R load over the square of this, RS plus R load squared times V sub S squared. Now this is good news. So now, if I let our load go to 0, the load delivered to the power goes to 0. So P load goes to 0 as R load goes to 0. So now, if I short the load resistor, I don't deliver any power to the load, which is what I want, because all the power is dissipated inside the source. Now, I want to kind of repeat the previous discussion for current sources. Again, ideal sources, including current, ideal current sources, can deliver infinite power. So what I'm going to do is connect a load to an ideal current source. It will look like this. Let me provide a load voltage and a load current according to the passive sign convention, and let's take a look at the power delivered to this load. So doing KCL here just tells me that the current going into this node is the same as the current coming out of this. So I load is equal to I sub S. And the power delivered to the load is I load squared times R load, okay? which is just I sub S squared times R load. Now, the current delivered to the load is whatever this source says it is. If R load goes to infinity, the power delivered to the load goes to infinity. So P load goes to infinity as R load goes to infinity. What this is telling me is that if I replace this load with an open circuit, okay, I let that load resistance go to infinity, I'm still going to manage somehow to push this current through an open circuit, which I cannot do. I would need infinite power in order to do that. Okay, as before, my non-ideal current source will limit the power that I can deliver to a load. So let's take a look at our loaded non-ideal current source. Here's my current source consisting of an ideal current source in parallel with a source resistance. I'm going to attach a load resistor to its output terminals. I'm going to give myself a load voltage and a load current according to the passive sign convention. And let's do KCL at that node there. KCL says the current going into this node is equal to the current coming out of this node. So I sub S is equal to this current is V load over RS plus I load. Now, V load is just I load times R load. So I sub S is R load over R sub S plus 1 all times I load. So I let V load be R load times I load, and then I group the I load terms. If I take everything over to the other side, rewrite 1 as R sub S over R sub S, I load is equal to I sub S times R sub S over R sub S plus R load. Now let's take a look at the power that's delivered to the load. P load is I squared R. which is going to be equal to I sub S squared times R load times this whole thing squared.
And now I'm going to take a look at this expression as our load goes to infinity. So as our load goes to infinity, r sub s becomes small compared to r load. This denominator becomes like r load squared. So p load becomes i sub s squared times r load times r sub s squared over r load squared. I can cancel this r load with that r load squared. So I'm dividing by the load resistance and p load goes to 0 as r load goes to infinity. My problems are solved if I connect this up to an open circuit. If I take this out, remove that resistor, leave an open circuit here, the current that this ideal current source says it has to put out has a place to go. It's all going to go through the source resistance, and I can dissipate my power there rather than in this open circuit. Okay, just because the ideal sources have some drawbacks doesn't mean that you should never use them. Sometimes they really are good enough. For example, our ideal and non-ideal voltage sources are almost the same if the load resistance is large compared to the source resistance. For example, we came up with this previous expression where V load was the ideal voltage source times R load over RS plus R load. If RS is small compared to R load, this term is almost 1, and the non-ideal source is delivering almost the ideal source's voltage. So V load is almost V sub S. It, under these circumstances, go ahead and use an ideal voltage source model. Likewise, for a current source, they're almost the same if the load resistance is considerably less than the source resistance. We had this expression here where the non-ideal current delivery was equal to the ideal current source's current times Rs over Rs plus R load. If R load is small and in fact becomes negligible compared to R sub S, this term is almost 1, and there is essentially no difference between the non-ideal and the ideal current source power delivery. Okay.